Yes, good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Stuart Mullen. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. Today is the Offshore Wind Day, the World Bank Offshore Wind Day, which we are doing in partnership with the World Bank and the ESMAP program. The entire day has been sponsored by BP, so we thank them for their generous sponsorship. This session is also being broadcast online, so welcome to everybody in the virtual world. The Game Changer sessions are a new concept that we have in place where we would like to challenge the idea of, we talk about these sessions or we talk about this technology, for example, hydrogen. I mean, there's a whole program going on in another building talking dedicated to hydrogen. We challenged the, our speakers today to come with examples of what they're actually doing here and now. So we, we don't want to keep, keep kicking the can down the road. The hydrogen transition has to start somewhere. There used to be that, always, that old joke, hydrogen is the technology of the future and always will be. We need to actually see some action today. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, whose name is Jesper Muller, and he's the head of sales and de business development at Steesdale Offshore Technology. Please make Jesper welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you can hear me without the microphone here. Great. Thanks for uh, inviting me, Stuart, uh, to talk a bit about uh, what we at Steesdale uh, are contemplating in, um, in hydrogen. In um, Steesdale, we are... Green one, yeah, it shifts. In Steesdale, we uh, are a company that um, is relatively young. We are driven by some, uh, I think, rather noble targets in our daily work. We are driven by climate change. Uh, we are driven by making solutions that make a difference. We are looking at meaningful job creation for everyone in the industry. And we are looking at creating value for our shareholders. But the cool thing is that we are doing in, in, that, uh, in that order. Climate first, job creation, and then shareholders in the end. <clears throat> And uh, I think that's, uh, that's, at least from my point, uh, really a cool set of values. The company consists of uh, four uh, sub-companies or daughter companies. Uh, we have Steesdale off Offshore, where I normally uh, uh, work. Then we have Steesdale Storage, which takes care of, on, sorry, on Steesdale Offshore, we are mainly looking at floating foundations for offshore wind farms. In Steesdale Storage, we are looking at storing heat in stones and extracting that and create uh, electricity out of that. In steel cell hydrogen, which is what I'll be talking about today, um, we are looking at novel ways of creating simpler electrolysis uh, solutions that are utilizing an existing supply chain. Then last, we are looking at <coughs> uh, steel cell sky clean. We have a company called uh, steel cell sky, sky clean, who is um, working with pyrolysis and creating um, carbon uh, or biochar out of uh, excess biomaterial from the agricultural industry and also generating gas which can either be burned or can be stored or can be transformed into fuel. So it's all uh, environmental uh, technologies we are looking at. Yeah, and see, so hydrogen is uh, the basis of today's talk. So in order to, to uh, make a difference in terms of uh, of the environment, we think that there's no way of, uh, of um, going towards a hydrogen economy without starting with uh, electricity. We will talk about that in a, f a few moments. But it starts with renewable energy, either solar or wind, and it ends with, uh, with a number of different uh, end users. There are, there are many more than the three uh, mentioned here. It can be uh, heavy vehicle refueling, it can be fuel cells, it can be uh, industry uh, powering or also supporting the industry. I'll talk a bit more about that in a few slides. Now, when we talk electrolyzers, there are three main concepts that are relatively commercially available uh, in the market today. Uh, there's the alkaline process, there is PEM electroly electrolysis, and there is solid oxide ele electrolysis. On steel cell side, we are mainly focusing on uh, the alkaline concept 
and that is from a number of different reasons. It's a well-established technology. There's nothing special about it. It's, it's, it's been known for many years. It's not been scaled up significantly, but it's, it's well known. No rare earth uh, materials in it. Um, we don't need to operate at relatively high temperatures, so it's a, it's a process that's relatively easy to master. And there is uh, also uh, an intrinsic safety in it uh, due to, uh, to the, uh, a relatively moderate current density in the stack. <clears throat> What's special about what we do then is um, that we focus on the megawatt range only right now. So currently uh, we are working on a three megawatt module. I'll show you a few pictures of that in, uh, in the next slides. And that is expected to be able to grow to five to six uh, megawatt within relatively same uh, footprint. So it won't grow much to grow from three to six megawatt is our expectation currently. Uh, the stack is mounted in a pressure vessel. I'll show you pictures of that as well. So the stack is in a tank, uh, and that tank is uh, expected to be uh, pressurized up to 80 bars on the later version. The current demo version we have, we expect roughly 35 bars, but uh, we see no reason for being able to move to 80 bars. That means a lot in terms of uh, being able to export hydrogen on the, on the long run. We're looking at innovative features in seals, membranes, and uh, new cooling systems, relatively uh, uh, new ways of utilizing known technology. I'll come back to that. The trick with all of our solutions is that they are all designed for manufacturing. And that goes for when we're talking foundations or hydrogen solutions or storage or, or sky clean. It's all manufactured or it's, it's all designed for manufacturing. We first start by looking at how do we want to manufacture it and then we look at how do we then design it so that we can manufacture it effectively. <clears throat> And the solution that I'll show, be showing you here is also designed for mounting outside, and we could easily see solutions where we place um, electrolyzers on offshore foundations, and why not on floating foundations in the future as well. This is what uh, the current version looks like. There are decided to, to focus on four different uh, elements of the building blocks here, and the beauty of all four of them is that it's based on existing technologies and an existing supply chain. First, we have the pressure vessel, which is a tank, which also resembles a tower. So that means that tower manufacturers, such as Welcon, as an example, can manufacture such a tank. The flanges in the end is similar to the flanges that they normally handle on tower sections. The end cap is nothing special uh, as well. And the, f and the, the welding processes can be, uh, can be upgraded to handle uh, the pressure that we are talking about here up to the 80 bars. So it's basically a tank with uh, sealed uh, ends in uh, both ends. Um, on the electrode stack, the pink one or whatever co color it is here, that's uh, based on, um, f on standard um, uh, heat exchanger technology. There are a number of different companies in the world that, uh, that manufacture uh, heat exchangers out of thin uh, stainless steel plates. Here, the difference is that, of course, there's a membrane in, in between, and then there is some uh, clever tricks in terms of se separating um, uh, the different materials while still uh, while pumping in um, uh, the hydrox or the, uh, the electrolyte into, uh, into the stack. And that is something that you can manufacture in many different uh, facilities in the world. Danfoss is uh, one of the companies that can do that, and they have the, uh, an existing facility available to start manufacturing now. Then we have the yellow boxes, which is, uh, is actually converters for wind turbines, and uh, also readily available. You can buy converters of this size in the market today, and there's nothing special about what we, uh, what we, uh, what we buy here. They can either find its way into a wind turbine, or it can be in, used in an uh, electrolyzer as this. So also readily available. The blue bits, uh, cooling systems, that's standard cooling systems for turbines as well, or any other, uh, uh, or say, industry or, or technical solution that needs cooling. So nothing special here as well. Here is uh, where we are at the moment. The first picture in the uh, upper left-hand corner is uh, our 150 kilowatt uh, demonstration unit. Um, which we've been ha having in operation for quite some time now. 
And then we are working on, uh, on the three megawatt unit on the picture on the top right hand side. We have a demonstration uh, stack. It's, not, it's just a small, a short stack. It doesn't have all the uh, elements uh, for a full scale, but it uh, proves the technology. Then we have uh, the unpainted tank on the right hand side and on the, um, on the lower picture right hand side, we have a picture of the same tank, but now uh, painted and ready for deployment in the stack. And in the um, lower left hand corner, this is a, an artist's impression on what it could look like when it's scaled up to, uh, to uh, whatever commercial size uh, would be needed. And here it's uh, depicted on an onshore, um, um, onshore location, which would be natural for, for the first deployment. Uh, on timing, uh, in 22, within this year, we will have the, uh, the prototype operational. And in um, 23, we will have the first serial series uh, ready. And in 24, we should be ready with a commercial uh, uh, sales for commercial operation. A few uh, uh, insights into uh, what can we uh, what can we use the hydrogen for and what kind of processes are we contemplating and not just we but the whole industry our part of it is mainly the the um, electrolyzers as mentioned before but from us from our point of view it obviously starts with uh, with the renewable energy either in solar or wind form and uh, the electrolyzers was, uh, was what I showed you just before that can be uh, that can be used to be transformed into to green ammonia, which can be used for either fertilizers or it can also be used for, for heavy transport. I'll come to that later in the, in the right hand side of the slide. Or it can be used for synthetic fuels of, uh, of different kinds. <coughs> we strongly believe that, uh, that in terms of transporting hydrogen effectively from, for example, from an offshore wind farm to shore, a pipeline solution is, uh, is the way to go. With the pressure we have from a standard stack, even, up to, even if we stop at 30 bars, we can easily export, um, uh, let's say, the hydrogen from a one gigawatt uh, wind farm to, to shore with the 30 bar pressure. 80 bar would make the, the case even better. So pipelines is what we, uh, we strongly believe in. What can we use the hydrogen for? Um, it, we th think that the steel industry is an obvious off taker uh, and also thereby contributing to creating green steels. <coughs> we think that shipping uh, is an obvious end consumer as well, mainly uh, potentially in the form of, um, of liquid uh, or synthetic fuels or, uh, or um, ammonia. We know that there, are, that there are major players in the industry that are looking at uh, converting uh, heavy fuel oil and diesel engines into uh, running on ammonia. We think that uh, large, heavy uh, haul transport could be interesting uh, with, um, with one of these fuel types as well, probably more uh, synthetic fuels than ammonia. And then last but not least, also as a sub supplement to, um, to energy uh, production, uh, potentially as, uh, as peakers, not as base load uh, probably, but as peakers, uh, this could be uh, an interesting technology. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jesper. Uh, yeah, just Thank please you. take a seat. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the three speakers. So have your questions ready. The uh, next speaker that we have today is Martin Dornhofer from RWE. Martin is the Director of Floating Hydrogen and Development uh, Optimization. Martin, please welcome Martin to the stage. Yeah, and, and I will keep the introduction of RWE and the company very brief uh, or not mention too much at all. But if you want to visit us and learn more about us, we are in A1 just over there. So pop by and enjoy a coffee. Um, and I would rather like to talk about what we as one of the global leaders in offshore wind are doing to bring hydrogen offshore. So to say to take the next step. And before I start with our concrete projects, I would like to start off with the why behind why hydrogen and why offshore hydrogen? Actually, two questions we should answer first before we go into the projects. Why hydrogen? I think I don't need to talk too much about that picture. I think there is a certain component of hydrogen in the future 
of the energy transition in the future energy world. You can take now any statistics you want, but the core message is, which is across all studies the same, the demand will just rise dramatically. And while we see now a phase where the demand offtake is a bit limited at the beginning, certainly once we're through all the challenges we see at the moment, and we'll get to back to that later, like infrastructure missing, then we will see a steep, steep uptake. Um, there is a reason behind it, and it's not only using hydrogen as storing energy, but it's also some industries rely on hydrogen if they want to decarbonize. That should also not be forgotten in the whole story. Why then hydrogen offshore? And there is certainly one reason for bringing hydrogen offshore. It's just the volumes we can produce onshore are to a certain extent also limited and will not be sufficient to, to fulfill that demand. Sorry. Good. But there's also a commercial reason to it. If you look at certain areas, and taking, for example, the German area of the North Sea, the far out zone there uh, uh, in the direction of the Dogger Bank, you can really make a case where you can say producing hydrogen offshore is cheaper by about 15% as compared to bringing electricity onshore and converting it onshore to hydrogen. Likewise, it can be deployed much cheaper estimated five to six years acceleration to address those zones, which is also in line with what we currently see when we compare our cases to what is currently in the Flächenentwicklungsplan foreseen to connecting those sites with cables. And cables brings me also to the last point, it's more environmentally friendly. We would have one pipeline to shore instead of five to ten cables going through the German Wadden Sea. Uh, but you can also talk about discharge of the water, discharge of brine, basically, when you do desalination. All that out there is less harmful to environment. And certainly, a lot of other benefits. You don't rely on an electrical grid, so you don't really need to connect the wind farms, um, et cetera, et cetera. You also, and that not to forget, especially in these years, you don't have onshore conflicts, be it for space or be it even for water. Looking at the summer we went through without any rain, I think also these arguments shouldn't be forgotten. So what are we doing as RWE? We were one of the first ones being engaged in Aquaventus and have a, have a quite decent share still in there. At joining, or basically with other hundred of companies joining us and sharing one vision, bringing 10 gigawatts of hydrogen production to the North Sea. And how do we want to do that? We do it with, on the one hand side, the Aquaventus Ferrain, which brings us all together. But on the other hand side, with selected companies out of that Ferrain being organized in dedicated sub-projects, which make it concrete. And that's what I would like to talk, uh, talk to you about today. Um, if you look at the current project structure in Aquaventus, you see basically the names of the projects you see on that slide. At the Bottom right hand side, we are starting off with basically three projects where one of that is Aqua Primus, and I will go a bit more into details later. That's what we call the innovator. That's really the step needed to enable hydrogen production offshore, to de risk the technology and being ready for a scale up. And that's when we move further north in that picture, so to say, that's what you see in Aqua Sector. That's the next step. 300 megawatts offshore hydrogen production, the pathway to the gigawatt scale then further out and named here Aqua Sector Plus. Certainly we need to have other projects surrounding that as enabling factors. There's on the one hand side the whole topic infrastructure, pipeline. That's what Aquaductus is about. And there's on the other hand side the offtake, especially when we talk about an innovation project, so to say, like Aqua Primus. We don't want to just burn hydrogen. We want to make it a good use of the hydrogen. And that's where the whole topic of aqua core comes into play and what to do with that hydrogen. Bring it to Heligoland, the German island out there, and decarbonize the island. That's the vision behind it. So to say, in a small scale, do what later on the vision is across Europe. So aqua primus, the core, core cornerstone, cornerstone in that one, is for me, the first and the most important step. And we hear later uh, Paul anyway from, from Siemens Gamesa talking about it. Uh, but just to briefly share with you what it's about. In a, in a rough outline, it's a wind turbine as we know it today. For example, the 15 megawatt Siemens machine here uh, named also on that picture. And then it's about bringing in a decentralized manner electrolyzer modules 
alongside with the turbine, connecting them directly on the turbine, placing them on the turbine, as you see it here, to enable the hydrogen production on each and every turbine. That's what we call also the decentralized concept of hydrogen production uh, offshore, if you should come across. That would lead us to the first demonstrator of that technology, which then also is the stepping stone for more. On the technology, again, I leave it, leave it to Paul. Putting now that whole thing back into bigger context, because that is what we are concretely on at the moment, but why we are doing it again. Yeah? We are doing it to really foster the energy transition, the transition of the North Sea to what has been called some, some weeks and months ago, the green powerhouse in the North Sea. And that's really what it is for me about. And certainly we will have a large share of electricity connected wind farms out there. But bringing that together with what you see on the picture, dedicated offshore hydrogen production linked with a pipeline, it could even be down from Norway to Germany to, to, to really secure the energy, energy supply here, starting off now and then in the long term fully green. That's in the end the vision we are walking, working towards. What that also requires is certainly a coordination among all the states in Europe, among all the neighboring states of the German North Sea areas, because only then we can realize the potential. But it also does require certain steps in Germany. And I talked a lot about the importance of Aqua Primus. The first step certainly is for such a project at that scale, you need to get some funding. And there is actually the IPSA funding, as mentioned on the slide, is, is what we applied for with the project. So we hope to get that one. Then we can make that first stepping stone uh, happen, which is the pathway to the future scale up. We also do need a further vision, which is really signaling also the commitment from the governments, from the stakeholders to make it happen. Two gigawatts in the German North Sea and multi gigawatts beyond in the adjacent states. That is what would, in our view, help dramatically to also accelerate the projects, which I just talked about and which I showed. Um, that also links into putting it in context of the German National Hydrogen Strategy. Um, and also, in the whole context, we shouldn't forget that these projects, especially at the beginning with their risk profile, with the challenges on the technology which have to be overcome, need a certain supporting scheme. So talking concretely about hydrogen CFDs and CCFDs here. And last but not least, we saw it on the picture before, the cross-boundary planning and getting out of a single country plan to really that vision of the Green Powerhouse North Sea. That's ultimately important to, to scale it up. With that, I'm already through. And as said, happy to take any questions afterwards or then the next days at our booth. Thank you. Yes, th thank you very much for that, Martin. That was a fascinating presentation and fantastic to see where you guys are. That was really inspiring. So thanks for sharing thank that. The final speaker for this session, and uh, please remember to have your questions ready after this, um, is from Siemens, Wind, uh, Siemens Gamesha Renewable Energy. Sorry, a bit of an old foible from back, back when I was at Siemens Wind Power. It's a long name. <laughs> Siemens <Yeah>. Gamesha <laughs> Renewable Energy. Uh, Mr. Paul Skerbeck. Um, he's the Chief Innovation and Product Officer at Siemens Gamesha. Paul, welcome to the stage. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here. I'm really looking forward to it, and especially the harsh instruction saying, not, do not kick the can down the road. Tell us what you're doing. So that's what I'll try to do. And it, it's, after these two gentlemen, I think it's, it's a bit hard. It's more or less all set. But I think Jesper talked about the technology in, that's needed to convert electricity. And, and Martin talked about the, the, the projects and the pipeline. What I'll try to talk a little about, bit about is more the solutions we try to bring into to the market here and what we currently are doing. And um, maybe before we, we jump into the slides, uh, well, we, I would just like to explain you our approach in this. We actually start to look into this like four years ago, and we realized pretty quick early in that process, this is huge, this is really big. If you want to do a significant impact by replacing fossil fuels, it's just enormous what it takes. And I don't know if you noticed, Martin, he had a slide saying that the current demand for hydrogen is 90 million tons. 90, do not sound like a lot. But just to put that in context, the 90 million tons, which is the current demand, and that was, I think, was growing to 500 on your slide. Yep. And that 90 million tons to produce that with offshore wind, we would need 900 gigawatt. Every million ton equals 10 gigawatt. 
and the total industry, I think by now you know better than I do, what have we done? 30 gigawatts in offshore wind. So what Martin showed is the current demand is 30 times what we did in the last 30 years. So this challenge is huge. And uh, I think when we then look at how do we overcome this challenge, uh, which one do I press? It, the big green. It works, but you need to be lucky, yeah. <laughs> now something happens. Um, just to, to give you a, a, a perspective on what has happened so far in, in offshore, and, and what you see here, that is our first offshore wind turbine we did in 91, and the one we are currently developing to, for sale in the, in the next years. The rotor went from 35 meters to 222, and Martin even showed we are going to a 236. So that is like seven times bigger. Uh, and you see the turbine that is like the foundation of the new turbines or something in height. And the, and the rating of the machines has gone up like 30 times from half a mega to 15. What that has led to is what you see on the other side of this slide. That is the reduction of the price of electricity. These are the auction prices from 2014 until 2019. And this curve is actually the reason we are talking about offshore wind and hydrogen. If we had not made that cost reduction, the hydrogen would have been ridiculously expensive today. But with this development we've done in the last years, we are actually within range. I think with the current natural prices, we can even compete. But, but we are not far off. So this development in the offshore wind is really the foundation for talking about the next step going into hydrogen. And just to give you another snapshot, this is how the technology developed on the offshore wind turbines. You see, we more or less in the last 10 years pushed the output to more, we more than double that on a turbine level. That was one of the reasons we brought the cost curve down. When we then talk about hydrogen, and now I'll come to the subject here, we need to do exactly the same thing, but we need to be much, much quicker. We do not have that time to do this. So we need to accelerate this, and this is why we already started to, to look into this and actually do things in, out in the field, having the demonstrators. And, uh, and what we have done in, in Siemens Gamesa in the last year is that we have built a full, fully fledged demonstration plant where we have connected a, a 400, it's not big, it's a 400 kilowatt electrolyzer that can, on, if it runs at full speed, produce eight kilos. That's far to the 90 millions we need. So this is just a very small one. But what we have done here is we have connected it to a wind turbine. We have run it now for one and a half year. And we have actually shown we can take the power directly from the wind turbines to the electrolyzer. You see, we have a lot of other things here. We have uh, buffer tanks, and we have store compressor and an offtake. And we have kind of demonstrated the full value chain from wind into the turbine all the way to hydrogen on a truck going somewhere for, for an application. This is, of course, just a small-scale demonstrator. What we want to use it for is exactly two things. We are currently working on two kind of solutions or products we want to bring to the market. And one of them you see on the left-hand side here, which is fundamentally going to existing wind farm, adding an electrolyzer, adding a battery, and actually making a smart energy system where you can decide do you want to have hydrogen or electricity today, uh, depending on the price levels in the different markets. We can even turn the flexibility of these assets into being able to stabilize the grid you know, there are certain markets for grid services, and with a wind turbine and an electrolyzer, you can actually give power to the grid when more is needed by turning down your electrolyzer, or you can reduce your wind turbine. So you can support the grid with this system, and I see a pretty big future for kind of doing these flexible assets that can do both depending on, 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 the, on the prices you have in the, in the grid. So what we are building on top of this is a smart energy management system, which fundamentally can optimize the assets depending on the market situation. The second thing we are working on is what Martin already touched base on is fundamentally uh, an all hydrogen producing wind turbine, which you see here, it's fundamentally about taking our offshore wind turbine, putting electrolyzer modules on it, all the process equipment. So what comes out is not electrons in the long run, it's molecules. And this is a project we are doing, as it says here on the slide, with our sister company, Siemens Energy, where we are launched a project last year. I think I'll show the facts on the next slide here where we are fundamentally targeting to, to make a fully operational prototype based on our latest turbine model. Um, as you can see, we will, uh, we will extend the platform on, on the wind turbine so we can have everything that is completely autonomous. We will connect it in the smartest possible way to the power output from the generator to eliminate all the losses we can. 
Uh, on this specific uh, first demonstrator, we, we use uh, five, five megawatt modules of, of PEM electrolysis. And uh, fundamentally, we can use any type of electrolysis, but that's what we go for on the first one here. Everything in what we do here is containerized, so it's something you can move around with the vessels we anyway work with in the wind farms, and it can all be installed with the stuff we already install the wind turbines with. So no need for big investments in vessels or shipyards to build big platforms or anything like that. We, of course, do it extremely modular, so things can be switched around, and we have integrated seawater intake, water treatment. We, for example, use the waste heat from the electro electrolysis to clean the water, so we don't need additional energy for that. It's something that anyway would have to be cooled off. Um, and, and I think, Martin, you also showed that we expect on the first one here output of 1,000 tons on a turbine. So it starts to matter. Even one turbine do 1,000 tons. Still a long way to go to the 90 million tons we need. Um, this project is it's actually not new. We have been working on it since uh, 2021, where we announced it in January. We are planning to spend 120 million in R&D work here to get this off the ground. We have actually got some public funding for it. And as Martin also mentioned, we are targeting the first demonstrator for 26, and we passed the first IPSI stages. We are still not there with the funding, but hopefully we'll get it. And we expect to get this into the water by, by 26 which is an aggressive timeline, uh, given all the new technologies we need to integrate here. And then we want to be ready for a 2030 mass deployment to target Martin's, uh, what was it you called them? The, hmm? the first one was the innovator, the next one was the... It was aqua sector, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, so we will fundamentally be ready for that, that timeline. So that's all, in short, what we do here. And I just want to do one final slide saying we are actually also trying to share some of the learnings we had from all the stuff we're doing. We announced a number of white papers uh, over the years, and there will likely be a new launch tomorrow where we will share all our learnings from our uh, test site operations for the last one and a half year. And you can actually sign up on LinkedIn uh, to listen in on that one if you want to. And with that, I'll f finalize my talk. Thank you very much, Paul. So uh, with that, we will see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, after these three presentations that we've been very specific, talking about technology that's happening now, does anyone have any questions? Yep. And uh, can I get you to please say where you're from and your name? Yeah, I am Prakash. Uh, I am from India. Uh, I want to know from you, uh, you are using the seawater for converting uh, hydrogen, I mean water into hydrogen. Yeah. So is there any process? Actually, I came a bit late, so I could not hear that. So that was to, to Is there Martin. any processing yeah. of that water before yeah. electrolysis? So, so certainly, the, the viewers, we, we have the turbine offshore. We have a desalination unit on that platform, which Paul also just talked about. Desalinate it, get it to the right water quality, and then convert it via the electrolyzer into hydrogen. Okay. And the brine would go, go back so and For desalination, do we use any electricity? Sir? For desalination of water? A electricity and also the uh, excess heat of the electrolyzers, yeah. Okay. So that you recycle. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vapor system, yes. It's a vapor system. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, yes, but do you have anything to add to that or how you're desalinating? No, oh, they said it all. Uh, okay. Produce the, uh, the water directly on the turbine, yes. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Are there further questions from the audience? Yep, one over here. Of course, Rico, all are on the other side of the room. Uh, I'll just get you to say your name, please, and where you're from. Kaspers from Latvia. Uh, what do you do with oxygen? Because like in electrolyzers, probably it's like the way it creates hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah, so the, what's the, the, what is the byproduct, or what do you do with yeah. the excess oxygen? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. The byproduct of the excess o oxygen. Oxygen. It goes back into the air. Okay, there's no plans to ship oxygen yeah, around? Actually, uh, you could also uh, sell the oxygen. You could still uh, capture the oxygen and, uh, and we'll say clean it and sell it. So there's going <coughs> to be a market for oxygen, at least for onshore deployments. <coughs> okay, interesting. Thank you for the question. Are there further questions? Yep, thank you. Yes, my name is Fabian. Have you considered the water consumption with this new economy? 
Uh, sorry, can you just, I, I have trouble hearing that yeah. question, sorry. Uh, the water consumption for this new economy. So you're going to produce electricity, hydrogen with, by water, or you're going to regenerate the water, or you consider the consumption of water, sea water and fresh water. So what happens to the water that we use in the hydrogen production? Do we, how do we replace the water being used for hi, in the hydrogen production? <clears throat> it will fundamentally come back when you burn the hydrogen, or whatever you do with it. So when we burn the hydrogen, it comes back to water and the process starts over again? I mean, for every kilogram of hydrogen, you use roughly 10 kilograms of water net, which Great. goes into 9 kilograms of oxygen, 1 kilogram of hydrogen, and when you burn it, they come together again. Thanks. Does that answer the question? Uh, sorry, there's a question over here as well, Rika. Hi, my name's Johnny, I'm from the United Kingdom. I was wondering about the, uh, the efficiency of the process when you account for desalination. What proportion of, what, if you were to burn that hydrogen again, or just you know, the amount of energy you get out of the hydrogen, for the amount of energy you're using or generating from your plant, what's the efficiency there? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. Well done. The efficiency of uh, having energy again from hydrogen. Uh, uh, is the question if you go back to electricity? Yeah, uh, yeah. Th yeah th th right. Then it is, it's pretty low, uh, and, and frankly, I, I don't see the main use case that, that you want to go back to electricity. You want to use the hydrogen directly in a refinery or somewhere. Be because, I mean, you, you have your electrolysis, which is, yes, but he knows better, maybe 70 to 80 percent, depending on the technology. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, if you have to go to a fuel cell, you may be below 50 net. So, you wouldn't do that in large scale in my eyes. Yeah. Sure, but there was some talk about using it for Pika uh, Could be yeah. as well. Could be. In, in that case, you certainly have that case, but otherwise I would really say you should use it as hydrogen. That's also why I started with there is a decent amount of hydrogen needed in the future. <coughs> there are industries which need hydrogen as hydrogen, so to say, not just as an energy carrier. And when we are, get, are there, basically, then we talk about the efficiency to converting it once and not converting it back while certainly you you, you could do it uh, if you have excess hydrogen. Uh? And, the, and the pure uh, uh, electrolysis process is probably closer to 80% than uh, okay. efficiency. Great, thanks. Are there further questions from the audience? Oh, yeah, one final one. We'll take the one final one. Sorry. Yeah, just, just coming back to the, electri um, the electrolyzing uh, and the desalination of the salt water, I mean, is there any technology on the horizon where one could electrolyze seawater? Not without cleaning it. You, uh, you simply that there's need no to electrolyze. desalinate and, uh, and have it to a certain <coughs> degree of uh, cleanliness, at least seen from my perspective. I think, that, I, I think that's, that's a long way off. That's a long way off. Yeah, there are some very early innovations going on on that, but it's not in, in the foreseeable future. Do you have a Do you know a time frame for that type of thing? When you say not the foreseeable future, <laughs> is, are we kicking? The, how far are we kicking the can <laughs> down the road on this one? I, I don't know, to be honest. What? Okay, we'll be watching, Paul. <laughs> okay, great. Look, thank you very much for attending. Uh, please give a hand to Paul, Martin, and Jesper. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And so the Global Market Theatre now will be converted into, uh, we're getting ready for a drinks reception. So the drinks will be served from about five o'clock onwards. So please stay around, uh, join us for a drink. These guys will be here for a lit little bit. So ha any questions you didn't want to ask publicly, you can ask them in private. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you for those who joined us online and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.